We're going back in time on Muscle Car of the Week. There's a lot of different aspects of muscle cars that people get into, and not just what brand of car they might like, but also the condition. Some people like perfectly restored, brand new looking muscle cars, and other people dig the ones that are called survivors that have never been repainted or modified in any way. And there's both kinds in the Brothers collection. And the one we're looking at now is a 1970 Chevelle SS 396 convertible which has only been driven just over 50,000 miles in its entire lifespan, and it is what we would call a survivor. Everything on this car is original except for the tires. There might be one or two maintenance items like the battery and whatnot. But overall, this is a great example of a car that was bought new, driven, and maintained, but it's definitely not a show car, uh, but it's true to form as it was when it was new. One of the cool things about this Chevelle convertible is that it's basically an all original car. It's never been restored. Sure, there's been a couple maintenance items done to it, but other than that, what you see is how these cars rolled off the assembly line back in 1970. The Chevelle was redesigned for 1970, and the highest performance version you could buy was the LS6 454 SS version. That had a 454 cubic inch V8, rated at 450 horsepower, and was really one of the fastest cars you could buy back in 1970. But there was a couple other versions of the SS, and we're looking at the SS 396. And the 396 was the top dog in 1969, and had quite a following, so Chevrolet decided to keep the SS 396 package alive for 1970. Although, if you do the math, the engine displacement is actually a 402. But again, the 396 already had some brand recognition, so they decided to keep that name intact. In addition to being a high performance car, these SS 396s were also very nice cars. And this car in particular has a variety of desirable options that would make it a nice driving car. Things like a power convertible top, power windows, power steering, air conditioning, uh, it's got the gauge package with the tachometer and the dashboard and an AM stereo so that you had good tunes to listen to as you cruise down the coast with the top down. And while the 396 wasn't quite as powerful as the 454, it still made an advertised 350 horsepower and 410 foot-pounds of torque thanks to a 10 and a quarter to one compression 396 cubic inch V8. It had a hydraulic camshaft so it had good street manners on a four barrel carburetor. And this one is shifted with an automatic three speed turbo 400 transmission. And it's got a 12 bolt posi rear end with a 331 rear gear. But of course the SS package gave it the good looks too. And this one has the cowl induction hood. Uh, it's painted in champagne gold with the white stripes. It's wearing all the SS badges and it rolls on 14 by seven inch rally wheels. The rear view of the SS 396 showed you the stripes continuing down the deck lid and a blacked out piece of trim that went between the taillights. And down below the bumper, you see the oval shaped exhaust tips, which were unique to the SS cars. And one thing that's interesting about these cars is even though you had a high performance big block V8 under the hood, they made them breathe through a two inch exhaust. Now granted, this was a dual exhaust all the way back, but today you think two inches is a little restrictive. One reason cars like this are important is for historical significance, so you can see how things were done the first time they were built. For example, when they painted the stripes on the hood of this car, it's my understanding that they used a template for the front part of the stripe and regular stripe tape from here on back. And the way we know that is if you look closely, you'll see a little blowout here at the transition point between what would have been the template and what would have been the regular tape. And you see that on both sides of the stripe, on both stripes, and not only on the hood, but also on the deck lid. So without cars like this, you'd never know because when you restore one, well, you make that a lot nicer. Back in 1970, the GM paint process for these cars was pretty extensive. It was an 11 step process that started off with a coating that etched the metal and protected it from rusting. Then they applied several coats of primer to the car. 
And they did take some extra time to apply more primer below the belt line and in the wheel arch areas uh, to help protect from rust. And eventually the car got painted with three coats of lacquer paint. After the lacquer paint had dried, they used a wet sand process where they took mineral spirits and fine sandpaper and sanded out any runs or scratches or touch-ups that needed to be done. And then they baked the car at a pretty high temperature, over 300 degrees, in which they wanted the lacquer paint to kind of melt and flow out and become smooth. So sometimes you see original paint cars like this where you see sanding scratches in the paint and people will challenge you and say, well, this must have been repainted because it had some scratches in it. But these scratches have reappeared in the original paint in many cases because after that bake process, you know, perhaps it didn't flow out quite enough or after that, uh, they might have gone to the GM internal body shop to get touched up because, you know, sometimes these things got scratched during the assembly process. So they oftentimes got touched up again before they left the factory. So if you see a car that has all original paint, there is a possibility you'll find some repair evidence or sanding flaws. And that's just how it rolled off the assembly line floor. This must have been a really cool car to drive around in. I mean, first of all, the top goes down and you've got a nice set of comfortable parchment white bucket seats. Uh, there's a center console on the floor and a bunch of really neat options. It's got tilt wheel, uh, there's a full gauge pack in the dashboard, an AM radio with a stereo tape player, uh, air conditioning, power windows, and if all that wasn't enough, you got the 396 under the hood to keep you happy. The interior on this car is nicely well-worn. It kind of looks like a comfortable old pair of shoes. And it's interesting to note that the convertible top is the original top, which is pretty impressive knowing that a lot of times when these cars lived in cold climates in the wintertime, the top or the rear windows would crack because when they get cold, they get brittle. Uh, and this thing, you know, it's far from perfect, but it's all there and it still looks pretty good today. Some people like fresh, shiny, new looking restored muscle cars. Others think they're cool when you leave them alone, unrestored and original. There's a little bit of both in the Brothers Collection. Which ones do you like? You can let us know on our Facebook page or our YouTube comments. And if you go to the website at musclecaroftheweek.com, we have a forum where you can even upload pictures of your own muscle car project. We'll see you next time with another cool car from the Brothers Collection on Muscle Car of the Week.